back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Uh, President Obama said uh, during the height of the last financial crisis following 2008, he said, if I recall correctly, that uh, it's one economy that Main Street and Wall Street rise and fall together. Uh, a lot of us challenged that statement then, and I would argue that my next guest's new report uh, may challenge that statement now, but she'll let us know. Sarah Anderson has been on the program before. We're always glad to talk to her. She's the director of the Global Economy Project at the Institute for Policy Studies. She's also a, a co-editor of the website there, inequality.org. Org. Uh, she covers a lot of financial, tax, trade, and related issues. And their new report is headlined. Uh, uh, let me find the exact headline here. Uh, Wall Street bonuses soar by 20%, nearly five times the increase in U.S. average weekly earnings. So first of all, Sarah, welcome back to the program. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm glad we're so color coordinated today. Well, yes, as we were saying before, can't <laughs> honor Prince too much, right? <laughs> um, for those of you listening on radio or audio, we are both wearing uh, royal, lilac. Royal lilac. Prince Violet, purple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's start with this. Um, I guess we could start a million places. Well, well, I've got thoughts to ask you about. But before we get there, if you don't mind just summarizing the report for us, that would be great. Absolutely. Well, every year, the New York Comptroller releases the data on how Wall Street uh, workers did over the past year in terms of their bonuses. And I uh, anticipate these numbers uh, every year. And I was expecting that there would be a big uh, spike this year. I was thinking it would probably be comfortably above the inflation rate, which was 7% last year. But when the number came out, I just about fell over because it was an increase of 20% last year. And just looking at the disparity in terms of how ordinary workers did um, in terms of average weekly earnings, they went up only 4.2% last year. So Wall Street pay just went further into the stratosphere, and it's just one more indicator of the extreme disparities that we've seen, of course, before the pandemic, but especially, I think, during the pandemic. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned before the pandemic, because I also want listeners to understand that when we say they soared by 20 percent, they were pretty fat before then. Right. I mean, we're not talking about a thousand dollar check becoming twelve hundred. We're talking about fat bonuses that, are, you know, that have been growing. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding growing since Wall Street shattered the global economy in 2008 through illegal activity and with no consequences for uh, those who did it. And they were rewarded for that. My sense is that they were uh, living high off the hog, as the old expression goes. Uh, even before this, and now they get this massive increase in their bonuses. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I mean, bonuses did dip somewhat after these guys crashed our economy in 2008. So that was a bit to be expected, but they have steadily risen since then. And this was by far the, the biggest bonus uh, on average since the 2008 crash. And one thing that we calculated is that since 1985, uh, the size of the average Wall Street bonus has risen 1,700 something percent. And if the federal minimum wage had increased at that same rate, it would be worth $61 today instead of the $7.25 that, that some people are still um, working for. So yeah, that, that's, that's another dramatic way to look at just the incredible divide between these lucrative jobs on Wall Street that you know, many would argue are not, you know, all that essential, you know, at a time when uh, the nation has been struggling to uh, meet basic needs and a lot of people on the front lines um, providing those essential services for just, you know, a pittance compared to what people on Wall Street are making. And, you know, when you say uh, jobs, Sarah Anderson, that are not all that important, one might add, or actively and deeply destructive. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, they can put the the whole country at risk. We we saw that in 2008, millions of people lost their homes, their livelihoods because of reckless behavior on Wall Street. And, you know, it's not like our old financial system that was designed to serve the real economy, provide loans so people could, you know, create businesses and, you know, really servicing those kinds of concrete needs. Now, most of Wall Street is about the, the casino, you know, it's, it's uh, playing with people's money, playing games um, with high risk investments, and that's how they make the big bucks. Right. And, you know, that statistic that you mentioned, uh, Sarah, about uh, if the minimum wage had increased uh, as much as Wall Street bonuses since 1985, it would be worth $61.75 today. And instead, it's worth $7.50, as it has been for quite some years now. And I couldn't help but notice that, uh, you know, in the debate that's going on right now, we have a lot of... uh, mainstream or power broker economists and others arguing that wage increases for working people have become uh, too inflationary and that somehow we should dial them back. But I'm looking at your report and it says the average annual bonus rose 20% to 250000 Five hundred dollars. This in a country where the average household income is something what sixty two thousand dollars, and that's for a family. So uh, perhaps for a working couple, the I think it's somewhere in the mid to low sixties. And the, and this is just a bonus. Right. So we're really talking. It seems to me about a grotesque uh, increase in what is already a pretty grotesque level of inequality in this country. Is that that fair? That's totally fair. And just as background, I started doing this annual analysis of the Wall Street bonus data because several years ago, I heard a report on NPR where they were reporting on the new numbers and saying, great news, bonuses are way up. This is so good for for New Yorkers because those Wall Street guys are going to go out now and start throwing parties and hiring caterers and florists and buying artwork and all. And that's going to really juice our economy. And I, I listened to that report and I was thinking, wait a minute, if that amount of money had gone into the pockets of the poorest people in New York, they would have gotten a much bigger bang for their buck because people at the bottom end tend to have to uh, spend every dime that they make. And instead of being able to afford to to squirrel it away, like a lot of these rich uh, Wall Street guys. And so I really thought there was a need for another perspective (laughs) on the Wall Street bonus numbers. Instead of just romanticizing these people with their fancy watches and and their, their yachts and all of that. And I think today during the pandemic, people are much more sensitized to this. You know, this is just one indicator of extreme disparity. We've also seen U.S. billionaires, uh, their personal wealth has grown by a combined $2 trillion during the pandemic. We're going to be seeing the the CEO pay numbers for last year starting to to come out. And thanks to stock buybacks, uh, record um, spending on stock buybacks last year, which is a Uh, It's a legal means of manipulating stock prices to inflate the value, and that just makes shareholders and and, um, CEOs with stock-based pay even richer. So um, the Wall Street... If you don't mind, let's stop on that a little bit, Sarah, because I think it's important for... I don't think very many people understand the implications of stock buybacks and what they are. Uh, And uh, you mentioned it's legal, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't always legal, right? right? Let's start with that. Yeah, so up until 1982, uh, there were severe restrictions on companies repurchasing their own shares on the open market. Then there were uh, changes made, and this has become uh, a favorite tactic to try to artificially bump up your your stock, not because you're doing it, you know, adding any more value to the economy or, you know, performing brilliantly or whatever. It's just a um, way to manipulate the value to make uh, your wealthy shareholders and your top executives happy. Most uh, executive pay nowadays comes in the form of some kind of stock-based pay. And so 
Um, la- last year, when you know a lot of CEOs were complaining about how oh a staffing shortage and and, and all, um, instead of like offering more money to uh, low wage workers or investing in research and development or other innovations, they went on a, a huge stock buyback spree, and it's just really grotesque to to see that happening at a time of national crisis. And I was happy to see uh, President Biden has come out with this federal budget proposal, and it does include some things to um, address this issue of the the buyback uh, bonanza that that we're seeing. It would both uh, tax buybacks, but it would also restrict executives from selling their own stock within several years of a stock buyback. So to take away that personal incentive for you know, wasting company resources on, on stock, back, stock buybacks when they could be doing so many more sensible things with that money. I've made the argument, uh, maybe not enough, but I've made the argument that in the modern economy and financial system, as, we've, as they've kind of morphed it, um, that every senior executive at a publicly traded company isn't uh, they're not in the business they're officially in, meaning if it's in a, a manufacturing company or whatever kind of company it is, uh, home products, uh, that they're really financiers, they're Wall Streeters, and that they're more, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating a little, make a point, but that they're really managing their companies to the bottom line of their own stock value because their compensation packages have shifted so much from direct pay and even direct bonus to stock incentives that give them every reason to manipulate stock prices so that they boost in the short term, even if it's bad for whatever business they're in in the long term, don't you think? I think that's a really uh, sharp analysis of what's going on and just how disconnected the guy in the corner office has become from what's actually happening at the company and the workers who are actually contributing real value uh, to the company. Um, it, in, in a way, uh, you know, they, they dismiss the, the contributions of those workers because it's a way to justify making 300 or so times what those people on the shop floor make. But it was just astounding to me last year, I looked in really deep uh, detail at the uh, company reports on executive and, and worker pay that they have to file with the SEC. And at so many companies where workers were just struggling, you know, losing income, losing lives, um, you know, really on the front lines of the pandemic, the the executives didn't make their bonus targets because, you know, it was a tough year. And the board was so fixated on how do we protect these guys from taking a a little bit of a hit during a national pandemic? Uh, Can we give them a retention bonus? Can we move the bonus goalposts, you know, in some way to to make them, you know, still get their bonuses? And that was the whole focus of the board, not on the fact that their workers were, you know, barely getting by in, in this crisis. And, you know, I think that's a great point, Sarah Anderson, and I, and I might even extend it to our COVID response while it has over the last since COVID began in the latter years of the last year of Trump's uh, reign and the first year of Biden's administration. I would argue that while we've done a lot of good things for workers in the response, not enough, but a lot of good things, I would argue that that was a key part of our national response, a federal reserve response and others was kind of the same thing. Can we make sure we protect the profits and wealth of the people who run large corporations in particular in the way we backstop corporate loans and allow the Fed to service corporations directly with the same kind of advantageous uh, situation that uh, that banks have had in the past. It seems to me we've also had a public policy goal of the last couple of years that kind of reinforces this self-serving behavior on the part of senior executives. What do you think? Absolutely. And there were some conditions on executive pay in the uh, COVID relief bill in uh, 2020, but they were a joke. I mean, they were just so complicated that like it, n- nobody really felt any pain related to those uh, um, restrictions. And a lot of CEOs, I almost found it laughable. They made a big deal about announcing 
oh, because of the COVID pandemic, um, I'm going to give up 50% of my salary. Well, you know, they know, we know that salary is just a very minute part of their overall pay packages. It made almost no difference whatsoever in their overall um, pay. And so it's a real missed opportunity to use the power of the public purse, um, all that uh, assistance that was going to companies to use it in ways that would have encouraged them to narrow their gaps between CEO and worker pay. But there there continue to be opportunities. The uh, Biden administration does not have to wait for Congress to act on executive pay. They could be putting conditions on federal contracts, um, making it hard for companies with really absurdly uh, large uh, gaps between CEO and worker pay from getting federal contracts. There's all kinds of other assistance that goes from the federal government to corporations. We should be using, as taxpayers, we should demand that every dime of that money is used to in- encourage high road business practices, You know, going even beyond the CEO pay issue to look at, you know, are, do they have good records on um, health and safety and environmental issues? Are they advancing women and people of color in leadership in their company? There's a whole range of things that we could um, u- use to, uh, to put conditions on that kind of federal money. Um, Representative Jan Schakowsky has a bill that would do that. It's called the Patriotic Corporations Act. As everybody knows, it's hard to get legislation through Congress right now. Um, But the beauty of it is the Biden administration doesn't have to wait for Congress in terms of putting conditions on federal contracts. And and President Biden has put some good conditions, Uh, you know, $15 minimum uh, for federal contract workers um, as, as one example. But he could go a lot further to use the power of the public purse to encourage better behavior. And, and it would be a big deal. I, I only learned recently that 25 percent of private sector workers work for companies that get federal contracts. So it's a huge share of our workforce. And uh, it absolutely is. And uh, it seems to me, though, in the meantime, that, uh, you know, until we're doing more to bring this whole conversation around to where we started, Sarah, that, uh, you know, what we saw, for example, after in, in our pandemic response was these these federal backstops were made available to corporations. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, but in my understanding, these federal backstops were made available to corporations with some mod genteel rules on them. But then corporations were able to go out and, uh, uh, you know, get private loans instead because lenders knew they had these backdrops. So once again, these executives made themselves extremely wealthy uh, without passing, you know, profits uh, down the chain and uh, Wall Street also got wealthier, hence these fat bonuses. Is there, is there a connection there? Absolutely. Um, you know, and it's, it's an issue that like you understand well, but once you ta- start talking to people about, you know, Federal Reserve actions and monetary policy and all of that, it's, it, it can, you know, you can lose people pretty quickly. So it was, it was a hard, um, and you have to connect some different dots, but clearly, you know, the, the government did a good job in terms of pumping money into the economy in a way that helps spur the recovery. So, you know, faster than during the Great Recession after the 2008 crash, but it could have been done in a way that would have, um, left us in a place that was uh, more equitable than going into the pandemic. And that opportunity, I think, was really lost. Right. Now, one of the things your report covers, Sarah, and I think is so important, is uh, the ways in which these rapid increases in Wall Street bonuses, which to me are symptomatic of a broader problem too, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, in and of themselves are a problem. Uh, it's contributed to gender and racial equality. You've made that point too as well. Yeah, I mean, it could be just so obvious that you hardly have to raise it, but most of the people in the upper echelons of these big Wall Street banks are white men. Uh, big, big headline there, I'm sure. Um, mm-hmm. Everybody knows that. But just to, you know, to underscore the point, um, white men dominate these lucrative Wall Street jobs, and um, women and people of color dominate uh, many of the low-income jobs. And so, I pulled out some of the 
the occupations that are just most critical to our economy and are in huge demand and yet are, continue to be so low paid. So I looked at home health aides and I, I think there's childcare workers mm -hmm. and like one f factoid just to make the case is uh, black people make up, I think 3% of the top executive management tier at Goldman Sachs, but something like was it 24 or 27 or, or so percent of all home health aides. Um, a job, I, I think it's about 24%. It, that's a job that, that pays, you know, in the 20,000s. Um, so 13%, it says men make up just 13% of home health aides who average $27,000 um, a year. Yeah, and, and I think, yeah, black, black workers make up 27% of home health aides. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the black white divide there is really, yeah. really in, intense. And why do we value things like that? I mean, has anybody tried to do the job of a home health aide? I mean, that is some of the most challenging work anybody could do where you get, you know, very little um, recognition. And yet, you know, there are saintly people out there who, who take on that challenge and they do it for average pay of $27,000 a year. And then we have people at the top of Wall Street banks, which, you know, ha can wreak havoc on our economy and walk away with just unbelievable amounts of pay. And of course, home health and child care workers have been hit among the hardest by the pandemic, right along with retail workers, grocery workers, and so on. They have been on the front line all along while Wall Streeters have been telecommuting and uh, from the Hamptons or wherever. I mean, I don't want to stereotype too much, but I'm sure many of them have. And um, and so, as you're pointing out, the ratio of sacrifice to reward is very much out of whack. Yeah, and, and underpaying these people harms our economy as a whole. Uh, one thing that we have seen during the pandemic is that Black women have dropped out of the workforce in in droves and a big barrier for them in going back to work is the crisis in child care and and to some extent the the elder care as well because black women tend to shoulder a lot of the responsibility for for family caregiving and so if they can't find or can't afford care for their children or maybe elderly parents or grandparents who they're responsible for it's going to be tough for them to go back to work especially if they don't have like paid leave benefits that many higher income people can rely on. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it, and, and ever, you know, many people rely on childcare workers in order to be able to uh, go, go to work. So to the extent that we keep undervaluing and underpaying that uh, part of our workforce, it's going to be crippling our overall economy. You, you know, I, I've interviewed uh, fast food workers and others, single moms, and they've said, look, it, not only don't I have benefits, they won't even tell me from day to day what my shift is going to be tomorrow. And if I don't know what my shift is, I can't arrange child care. And I think we're seeing the repercussions of that now in the labor force. Absolutely. And it's a, a crisis that's, you know, it's not going to change, especially on the home care end of it with our aging population. Um, if we don't get serious about trying to solve that problem, and that's one reason it's been so heartbreaking to see the uh, gridlock around the Build Back Better legislation, because that had really significant investments and other um, supports in it for child care and home care, um, and would do it in ways that both make those services more accessible, but also lift up wages and working conditions for, for the caregivers. So, I do hope we can get back to the table um, on that Build Back Better legislation, uh, which has dragged down now for way too long. <laughs> I remember they tried to tell us that child care and other service workers were not quote unquote infrastructure when according to the definitions of that word, social infrastructure is very definitely infrastructure. It's part of what makes a society work. So I couldn't agree with you more. Well, well, Sarah Anderson, why don't we talk a little bit more about some of the solutions that might be available to us in all of this? What are your thoughts? Uh-huh. 
Well, looking narrowly at this Wall Street bonus issue, I mean, we we got such an education in the dangers of a reckless bonus culture during the 2008 crash. And so in response to that, they passed the Dodd-Frank financial reform legislation in 2010. And there was a part of it that was supposed to address Wall Street pay and ban pay that encourages inappropriate risk. 12 years later, regulators still have not put that regulation into force. And it's just a a scandal. And it just says so much about who has power in Washington and who doesn't. You know, the fact that since 2010, we have not raised the minimum wage and they have not implemented this uh, restriction, which is part of law um, on, on Wall Street pay. So getting that in force would be really important. Um, Some things we think should be included in that are we think that executives should have to put a chunk of their money every year into a pot that that would be used to pay for any um, uh, penalties against the company for fraud or, you know, other kinds of uh, uh, wrong wrongdoing as a way to make sure that they personally feel the pain if if uh, we get into trouble like we did in 2008 very few executives really um, took much of a hit for causing that crisis. But more broadly, you know, I'm I'm encouraged uh, to see that the president has come out with a minimum tax on billionaires in his budget. Um, Again, uh, we got to get that through Congress, uh, which is no easy task. Uh, The White House does not have the authority to set tax policy. But I think it, it says a lot about the shift in the debate that President Biden, I don't imagine would have, you know, come out with for a billionaire tax a decade ago, but but the extreme inequalities have just become so outrageous that I think they're seeing that there's a real need for this, and especially to address address the uh, concentrated wealth um, that escapes most taxation, uh, unlike their ordinary you know, annual income, and and so the billionaire tax that he's proposed is designed to address that. So, and, and also, you know, we're, we're facing inflation. That's what's on so many people's minds. Taxing the wealthy is one way to address inflation. You know, inflation is caused by all this money sloshing around in the economy. Let's, let's uh, suck some of that up um, by raising taxes and finally fairly taxing the ultra rich. You know, one thing I keep bringing up, Sarah, is in the context of the pandemic and inflation and all that. It's the fact that Franklin D. Roosevelt proposed in the 1940s a, something he called a war super tax, which basically, which I'm sure you know about, but for the audience, basically said that uh, above a certain amount of income, uh, gains would be uh, taxed at 100% to pay for the war, and uh, because every, anybody could live on that amount. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, I'm sure that wouldn't pass today, but you have corporations that are raising retail rates, contributing to the perception of inflation while their profits go up. And there's a part of me that says, well, another good way to handle this would be to tax those profits at 100%. Yeah, so Senator Bernie Sanders has introduced a bill uh, just recently along those lines. He's He's not quite as bold as FDR because he proposes only 95% instead of 100%. He's almost there at the FDR level. And that would be on uh, profits above what the average profit rate was for like, I think, three years leading up to the crisis or some, something like that. And, you know, the, the a case in point are the oil companies that are where Profits are just through the roof right now because of, um, you know, all the factors going into the rising price of oil that has, you know, nothing to do with, uh, you know, the executives being geniuses or, or, or anything like that. The fact that their profits are going up, it's just a factor of what's going on. Uh, out there in the world that they can't, they are not in control of. And so why should they benefit so much from that? Um, when people are really facing the, the pain at the pump. So, um, and I think there are other bills that are have either already been introduced or in the works around like this excessive profits tax idea. Um, it could be a temporary thing during a moment of national crisis when we really all should be thinking about how to, how to pull together, how to make sure everyone is supported and protected. And 
we're not seeing that happening. So a good time to look at things like this. So maybe I should uh, conclude with this, Sarah. Um, how optimistic are you feeling right now? I mean, I know, you know, there's Build Back Better. A lot of us saw good things in that. Unfortunately, it didn't pass. Uh, you mentioned Bernie's tax proposal, a couple other ideas that are out there. You mentioned uh, President Biden's yeah. budget, you know, the elements of that proposal. Uh, are we... And if you think it's an unfair question, you don't have to answer. It. But but uh, how do you think it's looking for the coming year or so? It's tough. I think it'll all depend on how much pressure our elected officials are feeling. Um, people were reminding me that there were some good advances during the Nixon administration around labor issues. That wasn't because Nixon was really all that sympathetic. It was because we had a strong labor movement that was really holding his uh, feet to the fire. And that's what's going to make the difference here, I think, as well. Uh, uh, what's been, it, it's was incredibly frustrating to see the Build Back Better legislation get dragged out. I am still hopeful that pieces of it can pass and that it'll be a package that is both bold social spending paid for by increasing taxes on the rich. I think those are the fundamentals. I think we'll get something uh, before the summer uh, on that. <laughs> I hate to make predictions because I've been wrong so many times oh. over the past year. But the, the hopeful thing is that we're having the debate. Uh, progressives are on offense for a change instead of just beating back efforts to lower taxes, which you know wasn't just a Republican thing. A lot of Democrats throughout history have also been for, for uh, lowering, lowering taxes on the rich. So at least we have almost all of the Democrats on board with um, you know, rejecting that whole trickle down theory and saying we've got to raise taxes fairly uh, on the rich to pay for some uh, decent social investments, and um, you know what's going to push it over the line is keeping up the pressure from from the grassroots. And final question: uh, I always like to ask this on issues like this. Uh, what can people do? Well, where can they go to get more informed and uh -huh. maybe contact somebody or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, to be informed, uh, you should subscribe to our weekly inequality newsletter. And you can do that on our website, inequality.org. So that's an easy um, a easy step, but also don't give up on the debate we've been having over the past two years on a uh, bold transformational package um, that, that should move our country in a direction of sustainability and, and equity. Everyone is tired of the Washington gridlock, but we cannot give up on that. We need to keep holding their feet to the fire. All right. Well, Sarah Anderson, who has, let me make sure I get your title exactly right. She directs the Global Economy Project at the Institute for Policy Studies and is co-editor of their IPS website, inequality.org. Thanks as always for all the great news, Sarah, and thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. And go purple. Um, <laughs> and we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour.